good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark, and I am a director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy, and I'm also the facilitator of the Open Classroom. Uh, tonight, we are uh, breaking from our normal tradition and having uh, a bit uh, more of a free-for-all discussion. Um, this semester, we've been focusing on um, what happens after the pandemic and what happens after this election. And uh, as many of us anticipated, uh, the election remains unresolved as of this very moment. Um, but we have assembled a group of individuals uh, from uh, our campus in Boston, our campus in Charlotte, um, and our campus uh, in the West Coast on, uh, in Seattle. Um, and I'll, I'll just lay out one or two uh, informal ground rules. One is that um, we expect uh, whatever conversation that we have this evening will uh, remain civil. Um, secondly, uh, this um, session uh, is recorded uh, and will be archived. Um, and so uh, we ask that um, uh, you think about uh, the fact that uh, you are on air and being broadcast. Thirdly, we uh, very much welcome input from uh, everyone who may be participating um, in this conversation. And we ask that uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, you uh, post them in the Q&A box um, and uh, we will get to hopefully all of them. Uh, we'll be here uh, this evening until we're done. Technically, we're scheduled until about 7.30, but if uh, folks uh, want to run beyond that, those of us who can stay, uh, we'll, we'll do that. Um, and then finally, um, we are trying to think about uh, not only this moment, uh, but the future. Um, how do we plan ahead? Uh, what are the kinds of things that uh, may emerge from this evening? Uh, that require a little bit of introspection um, and a lot of planning and thought. Um, and so we're gonna ask that uh, folks uh, focus, focus their interest and their comments and questions on uh, those things that uh, are happening at this moment, but also on those things that uh, lie ahead. Um, I'm not gonna introduce each one of our speakers uh, until uh, uh, they're uh, called upon um, I will start uh, with uh, the um, one of the very few people uh, in this country who can really explain what this moment means, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and that is our Professor Emeritus, uh, Governor Michael S. Dukakis. Um, Governor Dukakis ran for the presidency uh, in uh, 1988. Uh, one of his opponents uh, in the uh, primary uh, in 1988 uh, was a then uh, young um, uh, elected official uh, from uh, Wilmington, Delaware, um, uh, who is now running for president, um, which shows uh, how long uh, he has been around. Uh, and, and Michael has uh, been through what it's like uh, to uh, go through an election um, and then to be thinking ahead. So I'm gonna start by uh, asking uh, Governor Dukakis uh, to just comment on uh, what it felt like then and what you think it feels like now. What are the candidates experiencing um, as we uh, wait for final results to come in, Governor? Thanks, Ted, very much, and thank you all, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I wish I could tell you that I feel great about uh, what's happened um, and what's ahead, but I don't. Um, last night was not fun, and the whole experience hasn't been fun, even for those of us who've been through it. Um, I've never run against anybody like Donald Trump. I don't understand Donald Trump. I don't understand what motivates him. Um, and I think he's a very bad guy. 
who's probably the most corrupt president we've ever had in this country. And a lot of that corruption hasn't even been revealed because he's so actively telling untruths and other things that you don't have enough time to keep up with him. Um, and I wasn't feeling great, I can tell you, late last night. Um, it looks looks as if he may, in fact, uh, Joe Biden may, in fact, pull it out. And uh, although Joe and I ran against each other, I can tell you that I, I have a lot of respect for Biden. I think he handled himself extremely well. Uh, and frankly, I don't quite understand what the attraction uh, for the American people is Donald Trump. I don't get it. Well, I think we'll talk about that over the course of this okay. evening, because okay. uh, once again in a, a national election, the uh, polling seems to have been off. And uh, the, some of it was on, and some of it, a lot of it was off. Yeah, and so uh, it tells we us. We have a few things to talk about. Uh, right. Let me it, just say one other thing, Ted, and nobody's really been talking about it. But this is now going to be the third time in twenty what twenty something years where the winner of the popular vote by an, by a very substantial margin um, conceivably could not be elected, would not be elected. Uh, and I think it's time to get rid of the electoral college. This is crazy. Where one country um, somebody wins by a margin of millions and somebody else becomes president. Doesn't make any sense to me at all. And I think it's time we got rid of it. There are ways to do it. Uh, many of you know that Common Cause has been sponsoring a non-constitutional -constitu way to do it, which is about halfway there. Whether or not it can be successful remains to be seen. But uh, to put us through this every year, when it would be so easy just to tally the votes, total them up, and decide who won and who lost, um, makes absolutely no sense to me. And less and less as we become, even with all of our problems, one nation. And we've just had another experience at this, um, and it's just nuts. Absolutely crazy. Well, maybe we can have uh, Professor Vicino uh, speak to that. Tom Vicino is the um, uh, past chair of our political science department. Um, here on the Boston campus. Uh, Tom, what do you think about that? And what do you think about where the election is at this moment? Thank you, Ted. Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, at, you know, at this moment, I agree with Governor Dukakis that, that it, it does look like, like Biden could, could, could pull this off. Um, it's close, it's very close. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of this comes down to uh, the current coronavirus pandemic we're living in and, and the record mail-in ballots that just take time to, to, to count. So every vote should be counted or every, you know, whether it was mailed in, dropped off. Um, but but keep, keep in mind that some of, the, some of the delays are a function too of um, how states have changed their laws and how mail-in ballots or, or, or early voting ballots are actually counted. Um, you know, the, the one right now that, that I think most observers in the media are looking at is Pennsylvania. Uh, so Pennsylvania couldn't start even counting uh, their ballots until 7 a.m. Uh, East Coast yesterday when, when the ballots, when, when, the, when, when the polls open. So, you know, I think though that there, there's record turnout. And so turn, I know we, we've had many, many of our colleagues here, here on campus have have been involved in a really important effort to, to increase uh, turnout and participation. And so that, that is generally, you know, as a political scientist, we, we view democratic participation, that, that, that's a, it's a normative value. And, and that's something that, that, that we, we strive for. And so um, you know, it's something that, that strikes me that, that I've observed over the course of my career is really looking at, at how the demographic diversity of the US has evolved and how that plays out spatially. And what I mean spatially, I, I mean sort of the big central city and the surrounding suburbs versus the rural vote. Um, and, and, and you know, most of the, the, the turnout shows that the rural base turned out higher than expected, 
we also see um, that, that, that different racial and ethnic groups turned out at different levels than we expected. Now, this is largely based, I think, on the exit polls. It looks like the black urban vote was a little bit lower than we thought. It looks like Latino vote was a little bit higher than we thought, but it also looks like the Latino vote is, is more bifurcated uh, than, than, and than we thought it would be, meaning that more Latinos voted for Trump than we expected. Again, those are just those are the quick exit polls, and I think we'll, we'll have time to really take a good look at at this as, as, as all the results come back. But I think that that you know one of the key points I've seen is that you know the country is deeply divided, um, and, and that we see it in how close the elections are, not only for the presidency, but the House and the Senate, um, and, and then if we look at, at at state governments and local governments beyond. So. Uh, you know, and, and there are key differences. If we look at where all the many of the swing districts, a lot of attention, you know, today and yesterday on Wayne County and Detroit, Detroit, suburban Wayne County, a lot of attention on the black middle class vote around suburban Atlanta. If we look at sort of the, the how Texas looked like it may have been in play, Texas was in play in, in the suburbs of major urban areas around, um, in particular, Houston and Dallas, Fort Worth. Where I'm going with that, and I'll wrap up on these comments, is that the suburbs are not monolithic. Uh, they have been diverse areas, not just by race and class, but but also by economic function for a long, long time. Um, and, and so with that has come an increasing inequality in the suburbs, if you will. And so you know these, these patterns of growth and decline suggest that if, if you run a campaign and cater to a white middle class suburbia, you will probably see different outcomes. And so we're, we're, we're in, in, that's uneven though. Um, that looks like it's held true in the Rust Belt. So look at Ohio, for instance, and look at parts of Pennsylvania. Um, but, but it's clear that, 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 that the suburban vote, and we saw a lot in the past month um, from the president about um, you know, the one headline that, that stands out is, is about you know, suburban housewives and putting their husbands back to work. Um, that's a very old, you know, 1950s monolithic view of U.S. suburbia today. You know, the major majority of, of Americans live, work, play, and vote in the suburbs. And so, you know, you know, we have a greater socioeconomic diversity in suburbs than we ever have before, more immigrants in suburbs than ever before. Uh, and, and, and because of that, we have more poor people. More poor people live in suburbs than they do in large central cities or rural America. And so our suburbs aren't built for that, you know, in terms of dealing with that diversity. So a lot of work in the resilience sustainability space is focused on, you know, how we can confront and support um, the places um, that are actually, you know, um, experiencing a lot of these, these economic um, and, and social tensions. And so that, that's my quick take home, I think, from, from the turnout. And, 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 and really, I th my message is that we really ought to focus on, on uh, the demographic patterns here as we think about building a, a future, an inclusive future looks and considers um, and values the, that diversity of people. You know, uh, you raise an interesting question about how we perceive what is actually going on on the ground and the changes in the demographics. We've been joined by uh, Professor Dan Lothian, who uh, has brought his uh, journalism class uh, uh, to this conversation. Uh, I'm going to look to Dan and, and I'm going to ask him, uh, how is it that the media seems to be shaping our perceptions of uh, what's going on nationally? And it, is the media getting it right in terms of telling us uh, what's happening on the ground and, and what folks are um, actually believing? Dan? And you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, that may or may not involve taking off your mask. Well, <laughs> um, yes, I'm in the class here and some of my students, so that's why I'm wearing the mask here. Appreciate being able to join in this conversation. You know, I think it's, it's, um, it's yes and no really to that question. It is, um, we are seeing that as the nation has become more polarized, the media itself has found that being polarized to some extent is how you build your audiences. So that's why you see, you know, uh, MSNBC becoming, you know, carving out the left. You have Fox on the right. You have CNN that was trying to be in the middle, but realizing that there are some 
um, you know, viewers who are longing for more of the, the left pull. And so at least within their prime time, and then that kind of bleeds through the rest of their coverage, there's more of this um, left leaning conversation that happens on CNN. And so that sort of feeds into whatever it is, the perceptions are and the understanding, you know, of, of the public. I, you know, I think the, the other part that, that makes everything so difficult for people to understand um, out there is this this heavy reliance um, that I think the media has, um, and we've been talking a lot about that in classes today, on 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 polling, right? And um, even though I don't think you know, if if you really drill down and look at the the polling um, re reporting on polls, at least leading up to the like in the last forty eight hours or so, I think there was responsible reporting that was just discussing how this this wide margin that we were talking about just weeks ago had had been shrinking right and so there it's also playing within the margin of error right so so there there are a lot of facts that the media um, you know got right in its reporting on on these polls but I think a lot of that gets lost on on viewers and and readers um, you know if if you if you hear for weeks that that um, Biden is leading by 10 points and if you hear the conversations on the the various talk shows um, and the various uh, you know stories that are being done on the you know the blue wave and you hear the conversations about you know there, there's going to be a landslide then it's much harder to reel people back in once the numbers start showing something differently. And I think that's what made um, made this story so difficult. And we thought that perhaps all the lessons had been learned from 2016, but I think a lot of lessons were learned, but the times have changed um, where now you have other issues that just further exacerbates the problem. You know, I think a lot of folks are wondering how all of this uh, large scale uh, national discourse has affected uh, our students and students uh, across the country. Uh, so I'm uh, going to turn to Hillary Sullivan, my colleague um, on campus, who uh, co-chaired our uh, Get Out the Vote uh, efforts on campus. Hillary, maybe you could talk about the work that you did and what the effects of that have been, what you're seeing, um, and how Northeastern itself uh, was engaged in the process of, uh, of bringing uh, groups of uh, new voters to the polls. Thanks so much, Ted. Um, so, so first of all, you know, I think that um, one of the biggest roles that colleges and universities should be playing today is creating active and engaged citizens. And we don't always talk about that enough um, when we have so many other goals that we want to accomplish, but, but really at the core, we should be working towards creating um, engaged citizens. And, and, and part of that is ensuring that our students um, know that they need to vote, they understand that their vote matters, um, but also that they understand that the education, um, that they are educated and that they have the resources to find balanced, accurate information, that they're able to um, know what is fake news, that they're able to recognize, um, you know, the, the spin that various media outlets put um, on information. And so our goal in the Northeastern Votes Coalition that have been so fortunate to, to chair with Ted this year has really been about that. It is certainly about getting our, um, our eligible students out to vote um, and you know registered and then getting them to the polls, but it's about getting all students um, the information that they need um, to, to understand how a democracy works and, um, and to make smart choices in that. I know that Northeastern has many international students um, and we want those students to understand how, how politics impacts their life. I think, I think back to being a young college student myself a number of years ago and thinking politics doesn't affect me. And our students nowadays know that. They know that, that politics affects them and, and they understand it. Um, and so we want to, to help them fully understand it. I think they're, they have an awareness and we want to deepen that. Um, so um, we have been seeing really positive trends in the last several elections with uh, students voting at higher rates. Um, Northeastern itself participates in the National Study of Learning, Voting, and Engagement, um, which, which pairs 
uh, public voting records with the National Student Clearinghouse data and really tells each university specifically what rates are your students registering and what rates are your students voting. And so back in 2012, Northeastern had a rate of about 47% of eligible students voting. That shot up in 2016 to about 57%. So our coalition's goal this year has been, let's get it another 10 percentage points. Of course, I would love to see it at 100, um, but our goal, and, and we should know this in a couple of months, is, is to get that up to 67%. Um, but our work has not just been about um, a national election. We've really been trying to to create some stability and, and some um, continuity around um, engagement, democratic and political engagement. And so um, we look at the, the 2014 midterm elections and only 18.8% of Northeastern students voted then. That shot up to uh, 42% in 2018. And so, um, you know, again, we're we're on to the next thing, which is thinking about 2022 um, and thinking about how we can get our students um, to increase their votes there. We're thinking about local elections. We're thinking about um, just again, really helping students understand um, how to connect the everyday actions in their life and the everyday events of their life and how they're they're connected politically. And, and I'm inspired and hopeful. I just came from uh, facilitating a reflection session with a group of Northeastern students and I left feeling more hopeful than I felt all day um, because they see the power that they have because they know um, that that we need change and that we need reform um, and, and they're ready for it. And, and I think we're all ready for it. And uh, Professor Richard O'Brien is also working very directly with our students. Uh, Richard, what is it that you've seen over the course of the past uh, couple of months uh, on campus with our students? And in particular, what are you seeing as among our students of color and the extent to which they're getting involved in uh, campaign and, and registration activity? Well, uh, thank you, Ted, and I'm um, glad to be here with everybody, especially this distinguished panel of folks. Uh, the sense that I get uh, from our students is that they're, they're more engaged from uh, a knowledge and understanding, but they are really struggling with how they should express what it is they're upset about or what it is that they have difficulties with. And although some of them were very supportive of the public displays of protests and uh, making their voices heard, um, a lot of them were very concerned about how it was being manipulated and the, the message was getting muddled and things like the Black Lives Matter movement being misrepresented. And they got very frustrated um, and last night we ha held a drop in with the students to basically watch the election results. And the thing that everybody kept sharing was that the, the anxiety was unbearable uh, because they want so badly to believe that America will be better and will do better. Uh, but they got very discouraged last night. And you know, as I was saying to the group when I when I logged on, you know, the expectation was that with all that this administration had done and the kinds of things they had got involved in and how much um, Trump had made not telling the truth okay with his followers, uh, they thought it, it would be resoundingly rejected. And when it wasn't, and when it even felt like there was a possibility that he was going to win again last night, it was, it was very upsetting. And I think the thing for the challenge that we have is trying to keep our students from losing hope and keep our students from losing faith that America can be and will be um, a better place. And it, it's, it's things like last night and even what we're going through right now that makes them feel like there's this force in this country that will just not let America heal and will just not let America get better. You know, the, I, I think the challenge we had with the polling 
was Donald Trump basically made it okay for his followers to lie to pollsters, right? They just, they did, they were just lying. And, and that's clear and in, in, in what the uh, data shows now, because people were led to believe that one outcome was coming and, and we obviously didn't get what folks had expected. And I find that the, one of the more important things that I try to do with our students is manage their expectations, right? You want them to be involved, you want them to be engaged, but you also want them to do it in a way where they understand the, that you can't approach it um, assuming that everybody is gonna do the right thing, that everybody is gonna follow the rules, that everybody is gonna play fair, and that, that even when that happens, that they can't get discouraged and that they have to power through and they have to not disengage and not um, avoid being involved. And so I, I think our students, we, we're gonna, we met with them, the, some of the student leaders again today, and we're gonna pull them together for a larger town hall conversation. But I tried to help them to refocus today on the things that they know are important um, to them, uh, particularly Northeastern and you know the, the conversations that they had with President Ayun and, and some of the other leadership and the demands that came out as a result of George Floyd's killing and don't lose sight of what they had done and the work that they had put in um, to, to help make people aware of what this campus can and should be. Uh, you know, the stuff around us will take care of itself, uh, you know, but there's so much to be done on the local level. You know, you really do want them to, to not lose the faith and, and keep um, staying involved, you know, and as I tell them all the time, you don't have to swing at every pitch, you know, try to make sure that you focus on the things that you want to address and address them, you know, with the best of your ability. You know, we have folks in this conversation from our campuses across the country, and uh, I'm curious as to how this election has felt and what the impact seems to be um, on those other campuses. So I'm going to turn to uh, David Thurman uh, from our uh, campus out in Seattle. Uh, what are you hearing? What are you feeling? What, what did this election feel like uh, outside of uh, the greater Boston area? Yeah, thanks, Ted. Um, you know, Washington State, where Seattle is, is, is a bit bifurcated on its own. The urban areas are heavily blue. The rural areas are, are pretty red. The state overall trends Democratic about 60-40. Um, and so in our own local elections, we see this sort of uh, right versus left disagreement over some fundamental things. Our governor was up for re-election this year, and the guy running against him had no political experience. His greatest claim to fame is that he's the police chief of a town of like 200 people in eastern Washington. And his campaign slogan was basically that, you know, he wouldn't make you wear masks. Um, mm. And fortunately, he was was pretty resoundly defeated, um, 60, 70 percent in favor of our, our incumbent Democratic Governor Jay Inslee. Um, but he got a surprising amount of support. And in my travels around the state, um, it was surprising to me the number of places where I saw, you know, his signs up and, and not just out in rural Eastern Washington, but just literally 20 miles from my house. And I think it's a little bit of a microcosm of the, the country as a whole. Um, and I found it very difficult to have conversations with people who were supporting him because we just have a totally different view of the world and what our role is it is in it and what the role of government is and and I don't know how we get past that. Um, Washington's a very blue state. Seattle's even bluer than than the rest of the state, and so we live in this little bit of a bubble. And everything we see around us, the world looks maybe not quite like I'd like it to be, but you know it's relatively progressive. And so we're a little bit shielded, I think, from seeing how, 
especially through the Midwest, you know, I, my friends of mine that are in states that are a little more of a, an even balance, 50-50 split, I think they're dealing with this in their everyday lives, that they're constantly surrounded by people that think differently from them. And I think um, there's probably some lessons to learn from them that they have a little different perspective on how the country is operating than those of us who are in heavily democratic urban areas. What, what's it been like in uh, North Carolina? Uh, tell us a little bit about Charlotte and uh, also Carly, I gather that you were out working polls yesterday. Yes, I was. I'm gonna let Peg speak to, uh, to uh, what it's been like for our students. I think the fact that we have a large contingency of um, students in our nursing program, it's our largest on-ground program in, in Charlotte. Um, gives us a different perspective on um, the pandemic and the role that we as educators can, can really play. So I'm gonna let Peg uh, talk about that just for a minute and then I'll tell you about being a poll worker. Um, it's, it's interesting to, to be in Charlotte or Greensboro where I live. Um, they are college towns in many ways. And so uh, the students are very active and very thoughtful in their process. Our, our nursing students are the pandemic uh, firsthand as they're doing their clinicals in the hospitals and doctor's offices. And, um, and so they're a little wondering, you know, the, the confusion about COVID. They see it every, every minute, every day when they're working, you know, in their, on their clinical activities. And they're, they're, um, they're focused on uh, the future and, and making sure that, uh, that everyone is cared for. And I think that they approached, for our nursing students, they approached the election that way as well. And um, here in, uh, I, I live in the Greensboro area, which is about an hour and a half north, um, northeast of Charlotte, and but also a college town and very different in its perspective. And, and uh, again, looking at the, the best for all, for all people and, and voting uh, and very active in voting. So, but our students see both sides of what's going on right now. And, and uh, we're very focused both on their, their work in their clinicals as well as, as, as voting. Carly, you want to talk about your your first experience as a yes. poll worker? Yes, I was a rookie poll worker in Charlotte, North Carolina, and my um, choice to do so uh, was really like a bucket list for when I retired at some far future point in my life. Uh, but with all of the uh, publicity around possible shortages of, of poll workers across the country due to the pandemic, um, I felt like uh, now's as good a time as any. I didn't take any fabulous vacations this year. I had plenty of time off from Northeastern. So that's what I did. Um, and I uh, actually inspired my husband and my son to also do the same. So we had three of, of uh, my immediate family uh, that, that, uh, that volunteered. And um, while it was a long day, we were there beginning at 5.30 a.m. Polls opened at 6.30 a.m. in Charlotte went on till 7.30 p.m. when the polls closed and we were um, pretty efficient about getting uh, out is I kept reminding people to, you know, that I've been talking to about this. We only collect the vote. We didn't actually count the vote at the precinct. And it's really important to understand that because we don't really know what the results are from our, even from our precinct, but we counted, you know, we collected those votes. So we were out in about, a, about an hour at, at the end of the day uh, after the polls closed. We, it was orderly. It was um, a steady trickle is how I would describe it. North Carolina has a pretty long history of doing early voting and the it, pandemic aside, people would, would participate largely that way anyway. So, um, you know, we were, we were beginning to get communication from the Board of Elections uh, a, a week or so ago saying, you know, based on early voting uh, turnout and, and results, we're, we're not expecting um, a, a surge on, uh, on election day. So it, and it, it proved to be the case. We had um, orderly, quiet, um, you know, variety of people coming through. We had, um, uh, several uh, elderly um, veterans. We had a, couple, a handful of uh, first time voters, uh, which was really exciting. We applauded all of them and, and that was fun. Um, and it was just really eye opening. You know, I, I mean, I'm a former high school social studies teacher. I love American history. I love, you know, all, 
learning about our country and that kind of thing. I thought I knew a little bit about what elections actually consisted of, but going and being a poll worker showed me a whole level of detail that I <laughs> had no idea. Um, yeah, so so it, it, was, uh, it was very uh, enjoyable and I will do it again. So and I would, yeah, I'm sorry. Hey. I was gonna say, I would add that um, I did the opposite this year. My husband and I voted by mail but we got our ballots and we made a commitment to take them directly to the Board of Elections. So I, that was my assignment. And so I did it. And when I got there, I had to fill out an affidavit that my husband allowed me to deliver his ballot. So I, when I came back, I said, no room for fraud here. That's, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so so uh, from your perspective, North Carolina will not be one of the states that we're gonna have to worry about in that regard. Um, I, I'm going to ask uh, Dan Jackson, who, along with a number of other faculty, has been involved um, in a uh, voter suppression uh, study uh, that has involved North Carolina and Arizona, two of the uh, key battleground states. Uh, Dan, do you want to comment on uh, the study? Just describe it briefly. And uh, I know it's a little too early for results, but uh, what is it that you hope to see in the research that you've been doing? Sure thing. Thank you, Ted, very much uh, for having me here. I appreciate it very much. Um, yes, indeed, uh, we uh, launched um, in collaboration with our, uh, our good partners in Charlotte, uh, as well as some folks in Arizona, um, a smartphone app uh, designed to test, uh, to actually time the amount of time that people wait in line to vote. The idea for this project originally came about, oh, well, oh my golly now, a year and a half ago, maybe mm. two years ago, uh, at the midterms when we started to see uh, some very long lines, very long wait times, a lot of uh, incidences of uh, what's called reneging, people who sit in line, wait for a period of time, and then eventually leave uh, the line without voting, um, and uh, came up with the idea to actually uh, try to do a more comprehensive study to see what this actually looked like uh, in real time, uh, not necessarily relying on um, uh, aggregate data, which had already been accomplished uh, using GIS uh, smartphone data, but actually relying on individuals who download a, a, an app onto their smartphone and actually participate in a research study. Uh, and so we were able to actually secure a grant at, uh, from here from Northeastern University's, uh, the tier one grant a program, we interdisciplinary grant program, uh, and we were able to secure enough money to actually launch this uh, in this election uh, in two uh, locations, North Carolina and Arizona. Um, now, mind you, we actually uh, applied for the grant and pitched the idea and, and sort of conceptualized the whole project um, in December of last year, and early January was the deadline a totally different world from the world we are living in now, right? Uh, so we had to actually, we got the grant, uh, we were thrilled to get the grant, uh, but then the world changed uh, completely uh, with the pandemic. And all of a sudden we saw a lot of states uh, pivoting to mail-in voting and we were uh, concerned that we are, are the vote line uh, problem may not be as big of a problem as we thought it would be, au contraire, as we saw in Georgia, certainly with the primary in August, uh, it still continues to be a major problem. But we were able to pivot uh, uh, relatively quickly and to incorporate a, a re rather comprehensive survey into the app to allow people uh, to participate uh, in this uh, research project, regardless of whether they voted uh, in person or uh, by mail or by other means, uh, Dropbox, what, whatever, what, what have you. Um, I'm going to actually drop the, um, uh, the URL for our study website into the chat so folks who are participating on uh, in the open classroom uh, can participate as well in our research study. It's too early, um, as Ted mentioned, for me to have any uh, results to share with you. Uh, we did have over a thousand, uh, over a thousand downloads and registrations uh, on the app. Um, and thank you very much to our friends in Charlotte for all your help uh, getting the word out. Um, this is a great example of Northeastern being able to activate ideas uh, through our network, we never would have been able to get the uh, adhesion into our localities like uh, North Carolina and Arizona without uh, our network. Um, but I will drop that into the um, uh, into the chat so folks can participate if you would like to. Uh, we will be going live with these uh, research results 
as we develop them over the next uh, few days and into the weeks ahead. Uh, and we are hoping to expand this uh, to do a better job of articulating how the differential uh, uh, distribution of resources, electoral resources can actually impact uh, our, uh, our ability to, to have equal access to the polls. You know, Carly uh, mentioned that things had been uh, calm in North Carolina. And uh, my colleague, Rebecca Riccio, uh, also on the faculty uh, of the School of Public Policy here in Boston has just come in from uh, a uh, major demonstration that took place here in Boston um, on uh, the Boston Common, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can comment not only on that, but also on the work that you've been doing with students and with, um, as you uh, have described them, suburbanites um, on uh, addressing some of the issues publicly. Uh, that uh, were the underlying issues uh, behind this election. Thank you, Ted, very much. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I think the overarching theme of some of the uh, protests that are happening today and, and, and probably in the coming days was really around this notion of count every vote. And the notion that that has become a rallying cry I think speaks to this unbelievably kind of dysfunctional place we are right now and how people are trying to grapple with that. Students are trying to grapple with that. People today were trying to grapple with it and our speakers were grappling with it. You know, um, Reverend Mariama White Hammond is one of my favorite people in Boston. She was a, a speaker at one of our open classrooms last semester on environmental justice, spoke to the fact that people have died to protect our vote. You know, we have an enormous historical investment in this notion of uh, what the vote means. And the idea that um, we could hear that, that speech that we heard last night at almost 3 a.m. Um, calling for an end to counting the vote, I think has a lot of people really floored and questioning where are we uh, as a democracy is the polarization such that that can't that we can even say that out loud? And quite frankly, when you hear that somebody called for the vote to be to, for the vote counting to stop and to declare victory, um, in a lot of countries they would be shocked that so few people were in the streets today, um, and that we aren't trying to to come out uh, in greater numbers to address this. And so I think that there's this this tension, this juxtaposition. A lot of people were talking about. Um, the mechanics of the vote actually have worked very well. I think that was one of the pleasant surprises. Um, the fact that we don't have a clear winner yet uh, is not the problem here at all. It shows that the process is going the way it should. And I say props to uh, civil servants, uh, to people like Carly who were volunteering as poll workers, to the election clerks, who have made sure that we're still counting uh, to the, the um, secretaries of state who are making sure that these things keep happening the way they're supposed to in their states. So there's this unbelievable tension between the idea that after all of that concern about violence, about disruption at the polls and all of that, um, the mechanics actually worked. Our civil servants have come through for us. And yet what that vote showed us, that process showed us was this dysfunction where we're looking at polls uh, where the priorities of people who voted for Trump and Biden are polar opposites of each other. And then grappling with the idea that this time around the vote for Trump uh, was an affirmative vote for Trump. It was not a vote for change. It was not a vote against Hillary Clinton. So I think there's an enormous amount of confusion uh, in among students, uh, as, as Richard said, this disappointment um, that there was not some repudiation, in fact, more votes to Trump this time, even the last time in terms of raw numbers. Um, and so I think making sense of all of that has students questioning, has people in the streets questioning, um, are we actually grappling, are we reckoning with the depth of our dysfunction as a society right now with the honesty that we really need to. If you look at the Electoral College, if you look at the disproportionate power of the Senate, uh, and you look at the incredible polarization, are, are, is the system capable 
of us navigating through this in a way where we get past these nail biter elections, where we get past this incredible polarization, or do we have to have a much deeper reckoning with the institutions and with how we engage with each other? That's a lot. It's a lot to absorb. Uh, it's a lot for our students to handle, but it is creating very interesting and dynamic conversations among the people who are, are coming out to, uh, to protest and take action and try to figure out, can we go forward together in a way that is more functional than what we're currently seeing? So speaking of the uh, legitimacy of some of the institutions, uh, Professor Paul and I uh, taught a course uh, through the Open Classroom a couple of years ago where we addressed the rule of law in a time of turmoil. And I'm curious as to um, what this election says about uh, the application of the rule of law um, where uh, clearly it, at least one of the candidates has stepped outside of traditional definitions of what the rule of law would be. And Jeremy, you wanna comment on that? And, and then I wanna yeah. talk uh, about uh, some of the steps we can take. And I'll remind everyone that um, we're receiving questions. We'll get to those in just a moment. Uh, but if you do have a question, please post it in the Q&A box. Um, there's some terrific questions coming in. So, uh, Jeremy? So, so, so Ted, I, I think that's a great uh, question. Uh, and I think that the rule of law is just one of many issues, uh, to go back to the points that Rebecca was just making, that our system is not really allowing people uh, to grapple with because they get an either or vote. One of the things that's the most striking about this election since four years ago, we've had kids in cages, we've had impeachment, we've had economic calamity, we've had a worldwide pandemic. But yet, as you, if you look at the map, perhaps Arizona will have shifted. Uh, and if Biden-Harris does prevail, uh, it will be because uh, the three states that Trump won by just an inch last time, they will have won by just an inch this time. But other than that, the map this time looks so much the same as the map last time because we're not really deliberating about things that are crucial to one of them because uh, it's difficult someone to vote on the rule of law if they think the rule of law is gonna to lead to their side losing, right? It's like if, if, if you're playing a game and the rules are stacked against you and you think that if I just keep playing the game this way all the time, I'm going to lose, you're gonna cheat, right? Because the only reason that you're not gonna cheat is if you think that if you play honest, someday your side might have a chance to win. And I think one of the things that uh, Trump has been so successful at is persuading his supporters uh, that the rules of the game as they've always been will never give them a chance again. Uh, part of that is because uh, we have such an extraordinarily overemphasis in our society on going to fancy universities and getting degrees, and that's how you that's how you get ahead. And for those who are interested in this topic, I recommend a recent book by Michael Sandel called "The Tyranny of Merit," which make, makes these things uh, makes the, makes these points. So we got to figure out, just as Rebecca said, and you know, to go back to what Governor Dukakis said before, uh, and uh, Professor Lothian, uh, some mechanisms through which people can actually learn from each other. So that it's not, right? If you think about like Thanksgiving arguments, I make my point, you make your point, we're, we're locked in our worlds, you're, you know, I'm an MSNBC, you're in Fox, not you personally, but in Fox. That's never gonna be a way that we're gonna actually tackle uh, all of these issues. And to me, the thing that's the scariest is that when you think about, well, what was this election about? What was it about, right? So Biden stressed Trump failed on coronavirus. Uh, and uh, he stressed pre-existing conditions. Okay, he, we're, we're, we have healthcare. That's about as far as the discussion went. And Trump, you know, I agree with Governor Douglas. Trump is a terrible person. He was a terrible businessman. He's been a terrible president, but he's a superstar politician. He is able over and over again to find just the right wedge issue to get people all worked up and just enough people on his side so that he can eke out what would otherwise be a hopeless task. To take the hand that he had, right? 
massive joblessness, hundreds of thousands of people dead, um, really no accomplishments other than cutting taxes on wealthy people and turn that hand into, okay, he might lose, but of course, that says a lot about the way that his shtick, whatever you want to call it, played well with, with people. And the last thing I want to say is the pollsters deserve huge blame. I don't care about how they got one state right or one state wrong. They predicted that almost every one of these battleground states and Senate races would be nip and tuck, that the Democrats were going to take 10 to 20 seats in the House. Now it looks like they're going to lose se several seats. And this has huge impact. It has impact on donors, where the money goes. It has impact on ca uh, candidates, where they visit. And it has impact on uh, voters. So, you know, you're in Maine. They tell you Biden's definitely going to win. So you think, well, I'll vote for, if, if Biden's definitely going to win, I don't mind having Susan Collins as my senator anymore because she'll be a check, right? Whereas if you thought the opposite was going to be the case, you might have gone for Sarah Gideon. Just one example, there's lots of examples like that. So what can we do to, to make things better? Universities, this is our job. We have to figure out how to promote better mechanisms of deliberation so that people can understand uh, what the issues are. And I'll just give you one example from law and then I'll shut up. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the issues that came up right near the end of the campaign was just, you know, ramming Justice Coney Barrett through the Supreme Court. The Republicans have a beautiful story about what they think of as a great Supreme Court justice. Apply the law, don't legislate from the bench, keep your policy preferences aside, right? What's, our, what's, the, what's Biden's story? What's the Democrat's story about what makes a great Supreme Court justice? Is it they're gonna protect a woman's right to choose? That's an issue. It's not a thing. It's not a description, right? So, so ultimately universities to play a major role in writing the story of how are we gonna deal with climate change? If we can't get people to wear masks, how are we gonna get people to do, do all these sacrifices? And I'm excited about that work. That's why I'm thrilled to be at a university and I'm happy to be working with you, Ted. So thanks so much for doing this. You know, one of the key issues that uh, uh, brought a lot of people to the polls this time uh, is climate change. Uh, and it, it's not at all clear uh, that there was much of a, a meaningful discussion on the subject of climate change. One of the questions that's come in uh, is around uh, why uh, it appears that uh, uh, President Trump um, has been able to undermine facts and science and, and how do we cure that? Let me turn to Jenny Stevens, uh, the head of uh, uh, the School of Public Policy and uh, ask her uh, as a person who's been working on uh, energy and resilience, uh, what's our role in terms of uh, moving forward the conversation around climate change? Thank you, Ted, um, and thank you to all. It's great to be part of this conversation, and thanks for joining us. Um, I've been really focused. I've spent my career focused on the climate crisis, um, originally from a science and engineering perspective and technology perspective, but more so recently on policy and, and the social dynamics of, of how we are investing or and promoting um, climate discourse. And one of the things that, it, that has become clear, and, and this isn't just with, with the climate crisis, but we have um, been in this landscape where a politics of denial, um, we have the politics of denying that the climate crisis is a problem. Uh, many, many of us are, are aware of of that. Um, but but it's, it's, it's much deeper than that because the same kind of leadership that we're seeing um, that denies the climate crisis is also denying the dangers of the pandemic, denying that we have an economic crisis, denying that we have healthcare crisis even before the pandemic, denying that we have a housing crisis in this country. Um, so there's like, a, and, and denies that we have structural racism, right? Um, so there's a sy systemic problem of denying problems um, and, and suggesting and putting forth that everything's fine. Um, when really so many of our policies have really been failing um, and not been in the public interest, not been policies made for the public good. And, and a lot of the research really shows that the, the reason behind that is um, 
the power, the undue disproportionate power and concentration of power and wealth by what I, I call the polluter elite, um, uh, you know, the, the top 1%, uh, some of whom are making money off of fossil fuel extraction and the fossil fuel uh, industry and want to um, resist uh, the transformation away from fossil fuels toward a renewable-based future, and to 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 sustain their their power, and and they've been doing making really strategic investments in uh, to resist the transformation away from fossil fuels um, by the misinformation campaign to deny climate science, but also undermining public trust in government um, and uh, dismantling regulations of all kinds that are supposed are have been created to protect our public health and also minimizing worker protections and, and worker rights. Um, so this is, you know, at the same time I read today that 70% of voters to, who went to the polls yesterday um, actually support an increase in government spending on green and renewable energy. So there's this disconnect between what people really want and need and the investments that we need uh, in our communities and in our um, in our uh, states with what the national discourse um, is, is saying. Today is actually the day when the United States is officially out of the Paris uh, climate agreement. Um, the Trump announced that uh, you know, a while ago, but because of the delay, today uh, was the day that we're out. Depending on who wins, um, you know, our pre the, the election, which we're, we'll find out sometime in the next few days, probably, or maybe a few weeks. Um, we can we can discuss the timing, um, but it's really going to be critical on this issue of of climate. Um, and um, we we really are at a moment where, and the whole world is, you know, waiting and hoping that it will go a certain way because the, the United States has contributed the most to greenhouse gas emissions in the whole world, yet we are the country that is being the most reluctant and uh, you know, not a collaborative effort in trying to uh, address the climate crisis. So with, with all of that, um, I will just acknowledge, you know, there is uh, lots of reasons to, be, to also be hopeful um, I, I'm often inspired and motivated by uh, the squad uh, in terms of the uh, junior congresswomen who have come, came on the stage uh, in the last couple of years and really changed the discourse on the climate crisis, connecting it explicitly to jobs and economic justice and health and housing. And that's what we need. And, and we, we, do, we, did, we have seen some wins in terms of growing the squad um, yesterday um, in some states. Um, so you know, there we have to keep keep up uh, bringing these issues to the fore, and I think connecting the climate and energy issues directly to what everybody's worried about um, in terms of day-to-day -day issues of jobs, health, education, housing, transportation, um, and that's really um, where there's you know a lot of work to be done, regardless of who who wins the presidency. So you've raised uh, a number of issues that bring me uh, directly to uh, one of the questions that, that has been sent in to us. Um, and, and I'll read it directly. Um, Socialism has done horrible things in countries from Latin America, uh, such as uh, Venezuela and Cuba. Why don't you guys fear that similar things could happen in the US? And in that regard, I, I uh, also bring up a comment that was made this morning on NPR, where it was pointed out that in Florida, uh, the uh, uh, Latinx population uh, is not monolithic, and that, in fact, a number of uh, people uh, who are living in Florida have emigrated from uh, places in Latin America where socialist governments um, uh, are perceived to have really undermined the economies and hurt the people. And that played well uh, with uh, some of the electorate in Florida, uh, enough perhaps to have even swung the election. So the question is, um, why don't we fear uh, that uh, similar things could happen in the United States? So, so this is a good example of the point I was trying to make before. 
People understand what socialism is, sort of. It's clear, big, bold line. So Trump says, it's either me or socialism. And Biden says, totally correctly and completely right, I'm not a socialist. Stop pretending like you're running against Bernie Sanders. You're running against me. And when the voter says, okay, I know what Trump is. You're not a socialist. What are you, right? Now he can say I'm a Democrat, right? But what does being a Democrat mean in terms of a understanding of how the world works that connects to a voter and makes things better? And the Democrats don't have good answers to questions like that. And so as a result of that, the socialism label, which with respect to Biden is a completely ridiculous thing, same thing for Kamala Harris, sticks to them because people's understandings are very much in either or. You're this, you're a capitalist or you're a socialist, right? Trump's a capitalist, therefore Biden must be a socialist. And so, and so it works. So why are we not afraid of becoming bad things happening for socialism? Well, those of us who are for Bernie Sanders might have, might have to answer that, but those of us who are for Biden, that's not a really good question. What's interesting too, is that if you look at the political ads down in Miami, um, you don't even have to have a very deep debate over, you know, what socialism is and, you know, and, and Biden to, to present some real deep argument on it. All they're doing is putting up shots of Castro and other scary figures. And you, with the audio off, you don't even have to listen to what they're saying. I people want to, in, I want to unmute my, people from Cuba can sit up. there and look at something and say, I don't want that. And if he's that, I'm going to vote against it. It's as simple as that. And that's what happened in Miami. What was frustrating was you could have seen this coming from left field. You know, it, 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 the strategy that Trump has used from the day he got elected was say it enough until people believe it, whether it's true or not. And they should have known that was coming with the Latino community, right? And, and that, that, that was the thing that was troubling about Miami-Dade County. Um, that was a hot spot during the four years ago, you know, with, with Hillary Clinton trying to appeal to the, to the Cuban community. Rich, pardon uh, me for interrupting. Can you guys hear me now? We yes. can. Yeah, we sure can. All right. yeah, but go, go ahead, Gov. I was just sort of you know, oh, no, it's right. Right. okay. <laughs> Look, first, I don't know what people, I don't know what they mean when they talk about socialism. I have no idea what, what are they talking about? Uh, Soviet socialism, uh, British Labour Party socialism, or what? I mean, Bernie, Bernie Sanders is a socialist because he's for universal Medicare. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, and 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 letting uh, Trump get away with this is crazy. We should have killed him. Let me just re I'm sorry to go off off the subject, but it's 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 something that's been bothering me for a long time, Ted. Where were, where was academia and where was Northeastern on the subject of crime? Why didn't we do anything? Boston. Massachusetts has the lowest homicide rate in America. There's a reason for it. A lot of it has to do with Northeastern University and something called community policing, which began many years ago when a new generation of young police commanders, Bill Bratton was one of them, but there were many of them, began asserting themselves in leadership roles in the police. Never heard from anybody on the subject. Never heard from anybody on the subject. We don't have the death penalty. We're considered a liberal state when it comes to uh, these kinds of issues. And I guess we are, but we have the lowest homicide rate in America. Nobody said this. Nobody said it. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm baffled. I mean, defi defund the police. Are people serious? Are they serious? They don't think we need law enforcement? I'm sorry, folks. Of course we do. We need community-involved law enforcement that's effective. And I would argue that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts under, you know, not just yours truly, lots of folks, 
have been doing a hell of a job of providing that in a way to repeat that has given us the lowest homicide rate in America. So I didn't say that in 1988 when I was debating George H.W. Bush. So, um, you know, academia, academia has to stand up here and assert itself. But socialism, what the hell are they talking about? Universal health care? I don't know. Ronald Reagan, uh, I take it back, uh, pre-Reagan. But Ray, Reagan was the guy that kept talking about Medicare as being socialism. Funny, millions of folks in this state are covered by Medicare and are very happy to be so. Sorry to kind of jump around here, but I mean, you know, we are doing some, we are doing some important things, and we ought to, we ought to tell people that instead of kind of sitting there silently while folks talk about defunding the police. It's the well, craziest thing the I've ever heard. One of the interesting uh, uh, questions that's uh, come across the line here uh, is around um, what the university's role is uh, in asserting alternative uh, forms of discourse and alternative solutions. And I think you're absolutely right that the uh, discussion of uh, criminal justice focused almost entirely on riots uh, that might take place and not on uh, what uh, effective uh, community What's policing might community do. Poli yeah, I mean, and that's very important, folks. That's very important. And we have made great progress. We still have a lot to do, obviously. But policing today is so different from what it was when I started in politics. I mean, there's no, there's no comparison. And we've got, got to keep working at it. I, I didn't hear, Ted, I didn't hear much of anybody talking about community policing during all of this and, uh, and its effectiveness. And it's effective, I'll tell you, if it's done right. No question about it. Anyway, enough for me. But I mean, that's, you know, in the socialism thing, Jesus, I mean, <laughs> well, Bernie you know, is, Bo, Bo, Bernie's a socialist because he's, because he's for universal Medicare. I mean, this is absurd. Well, I would also just add from the perspective as facilitator of, uh, of these uh, conversations, uh, one of the questions that came across is uh, why we don't hear more uh, from people who have conservative views, uh, as well as those who, uh, to a large extent, may represent the kind of bubble uh, of uh, progressive liberalism that seems to exist uh, in New England and, and in particular in Boston. And uh, my response to that is, we have sought to invite uh, a very diverse group of, of voices and almost invariably the most conservative uh, uh, possible uh, voices have elected not to come on the air with us. I think that there is a, a fear or a concern that they're gonna be drowned out. And I think we would love to hear more from them in order to uh, increase the uh, level of honest discourse and, and dialogue that we need to have. Um, I, I wanna to go to, um, uh, the folks in North Carolina and, and then back to uh, Rebecca on, on what some of the issues are um, that you've heard on the ground uh, where you are and how are those issues being discussed? Well, well Ted, here in Charlotte, uh, one of the issues that um, I'm pleased to report uh, that was on our ballot was a series of bond issues that would support neighborhood development, transportation, and um, uh, affordable housing. And that's an issue that I think that the Charlotte community has an awareness of due to a report that came out, a very unfavorable report about Charlotte, where we call it the 50 out of 50. Uh, we ended up being uh, evaluated for economic mobility, part of a study out of Harvard, and Charlotte landed at the very bottom of the 50 largest uh, cities in uh, the US for the opportunity for a young person born into poverty to, um, or I should say the lowest 20, 20th percent to actually reach the highest 20th percent in our community. And I think that that really uh, hit 
hit home, hit, hit a lot of people in this community really hard. There have been a lot of uh, follow on activities and uh, the fact that we voted um, for those bond issues for affordable housing, for transportation, et cetera, in this, this most recent election. And it passed by you know, a 70, 30 margin. And, and I think that you know, those are some issues, affordable housing, somebody else referenced it in, in their comments earlier, is, uh, is an issue that in this community at least is, is um, you know, one that, that people are paying attention to and actually voting to do something about. I wanted to um, just mention in response to the question of, um, about framing about socialism, mm -hmm. just kind of, I think, especially now that we're in this disruptive moment of the pandemic, um, I think we're gonna, I hope, that we acknowledge that we need public investments. We need public investments in public health. We need public investments in public housing. We need public investments in job creation, uh, whether that be renewable energy investments, other, other places. Um, and public investments at, and doesn't, isn't a philosophy of governance, capitalism versus socialism. It's, it's a, a, a piece of society, no matter how, how you characterize um, the, the the framework? So I think um, I think that's if you if we think about what do our communities need, what do our the households and families need right now? Um, we need public investments, and and you know we 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 have to re um, rebuild trust that government. Uh, Investments are are an important piece of what we how to how to move forward and how to um, uh, build a, a more inclusive and, and prosperous society for everybody. And on the West Coast, uh, issues that have been discussed. You know, um, the issue of. Uh, Distribution of wealth is a common protest uh, topic in Seattle. Uh, the um, uh, many of you probably heard about our Capitol Hill autonomous zone that we had going on over the summer. That was a whole section of one of the neighborhoods that the uh, protesters tried to declare as being independent from the city. Um, protest started up again last night, even before um, election results were starting to roll in. There's this. There's just a great many people who are frustrated with the current state of affairs on both sides. Um, and it, it's a divide that, you know, I think across America, but we see it, we see it in spades here in Seattle, um, that I don't know how we get around. I wonder, I worry a little bit that um, even this panel might be, be uh, emblematic of, of part of the problem, right? We're all on the same side of the, the issues here, more or less. Um, we, don't, we don't have a diversity of voices here having this discussion. Um, but I don't know how we get there with and, and keep it civil, because I've seen so many of these um, panels that, that where people try to bring different voices together, they, just, they talk past each other. And I don't, I don't know how we get beyond that. I don't know if anybody's got any ideas on that. I got a lot of ideas on it. And I think I did it pretty well. How do you do this? You create working groups. You invite people of varying views to come together. If it's the governor, the mayor, somebody in a position of responsibility, it's easier to do that. And I used to do it all the time, and I never remember anybody saying, screw you, governor, I don't want to participate. Even folks that didn't agree with me, even folks that were on the other side politically, if you invite them in, they'll come. And it's amazing what you're able to do. Now, you need good staff, you need a process that works. But it's not complicated. And with very rare exceptions, we had great success with these working groups. In column socialism didn't, you know, talk about de defunding the police. But we certainly brought groups in together. And with rare exceptions, they did incredibly effective work. De defunding the police is the most unfortunate marketing tagline that any uh, uh, <laughs> movement ever came up with. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. Um, David, I would also say too, we can't be afraid to know what's 
in our environment and what's among us. You know, we used to do uh, campus climate surveys to understand where people's thinking was on issues like race and issues like diversity. And the surprise to a lot of folks of how vastly different some of the views along the spectrum was pushed the, the university to not do it anymore, you know? And, and, and so I think really knowing who's here and knowing who's thinking what, or at least get a general sense of, you know, what type of ideas are exist among us, uh, I think will make it easier to be able to invite that kind of conversation. Uh, but right now you feel like you, you, you really don't know until they do a straw poll like they did four years ago and Trump ends up winning on campus and people are all shocked, right? <laughs> And, and we didn't do a straw poll this year, as far as I know. It's, it's oh, they've crazy. stayed as far away from that as they could. <laughs> but Rich, you want to bring people together. Yeah. The hell with the polls. <laughs> bring them together. You know, I, well, these working groups of mine usually didn't number more than 25 or 30, but they represented a fairly good cross-section of the community, depending on what the problem was. Yeah. And I will yeah. tell you, they did incredibly good work. Mm -hmm. And they got to they got to like each other. Yeah. <laughs> they got to know yeah. each other. Now it hurt. It helps if you have a, a person in, in a position of political responsibility at whatever level who does the inviting. Yeah. And says, "Hey, this is this is serious. I need you," and so on and so forth. But um, we had great success with this. Well, I, I think I think you're right, Governor. Too. I think uh, as faculty, we have to to own some of the responsibility in the classroom to make it comfortable for folks who have conservative views to, to speak up, you know? And, and I've had some of that in my class where students will openly say, you know, they don't wanna share their views because they know it's not part of the dominant viewpoint. And, and, and so they just assume not get involved in those kind of conversations. Well, put, them on a working a group on, put them on a working group on community policing. Okay. <laughs> And tell them you're serious. And they'll come, <laughs> really, and do great gotcha. work. And, and I think about, a lot of people would about be twenty it. took me about twenty years to figure this out, but you yeah. know, finally kind of got it. I also think a lot of people would be very surprised uh, to hear the viewpoints uh, that are sometimes uh, withheld. Um, if if they really uh, were open to hearing what some of our students are saying in terms of uh, their own views and their parents' views. Um, I have uh, sat in journalism classes, for example, where uh, students, uh, somewhat surprisingly to me, were much more conservative than I would have anticipated. We need to hear those viewpoints uh, because living in a bubble um, is uh, living with a level of naivete uh, about how the world is uh, really operating. And Dan, you and your uh, students and, and classes have been addressing these issues. I'm very curious um, about that and also about the role of, of social media um, in uh, shaping attitudes on and off campus and how uh, social media may have affected uh, the outcome of this election. Well, I think, you know, we can, on the social media component, we can talk about that for about a month. Right. I mean, there's just so much that we can unpack there. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But to the issue of of um, making the classroom feel as if all voices are respected. It's something that I do on the first day of class. I don't know if I did it in this class, but certainly my other class uh, um, that I teach, which is understanding today's news. Um, I on the day one, I said, look, I understand that most people here are probably leaning left. But I, I think that we need to be respectful of voices that support President Trump. I said there'll be a lot of things that we discussed that might be critical of him. We're talking more sometimes about him as a person um, and, but, or a policy matter, but there, it should all be done within the realm of respect. Even today, as we were analyzing the, the, um, both of the speeches um, that were made last night, uh, you know, Vice President Biden's speech and then talking about that and then President uh, Trump's speech, which actually had a lot of false information in it. And before I played it, I said, you know, we're going to we're going to be critical of some of the things that are done and said it in, within his comments. 
but I want to make sure that if, in fact, some of you who may have voted for him, um, your parents may have voted for him, feel um, that you can have a conversation about what was said in a respectful way. So I try to, from time to time, bring that up. Um, yes, students, if they feel they're, they're you know, the, the, the odd person out, might not feel, um, you know, comfortable always speaking up, uh, but I try to encourage that. With regards to social media, I think, you know, yeah, social media is a major problem. It's probably the biggest problem uh, because people, that's where a lot of false information gets circulated around. It, you, everyone, no matter what you do, you operate within the bubble of people who think like you, um, who, who believe like you, who want to read and, and find out more information just like you. Um, so you're not gonna get um, a balanced view of what's going on in the world. Um, and it, it only intensified you know, during this election cycle. I've never unfriended anyone on social media in the past, but it got so toxic that I had to do that you know, because the kinds of things that were circ the false information, someone would just make something up and call it you know, the, the New England banner or whatever. And someone says, did you see the article um, with just false information? And they would share it, oftentimes not really reading the entire article, but whatever the headline would say would be enough for them to send it around and the thing would be shared thousands of times. Um, that's a problem. And as we know, it's not a problem that's easily um, resolved because the various different platforms are trying to do this and that. I do think that there are um, there were some steps that were taken in terms of notifications um, to alert you to you know whether or not that information was questionable or whatever. It, it was a little distracting with stuff popping up all the time, but I think it was useful in addressing um, this one problem. And finally, and I don't want to take up too much time here, but back to the issue of um, just the overall, I guess it's, when, when I think about what happened um, across the country during this election and why issues weren't addressed, I almost see this election as a write-off, right? Because Issues, people didn't, Biden was not nominated because of issues. Now, that's a blanket statement. Obviously, there are people who might have thought, oh, you know, there's this issue or that issue. He was, he, was, he was nominated because, well, he's this guy who could restore calm and decency and so forth. It, it, it really wasn't about the issue, I think any issue that he had. It was, he's the guy who can perhaps beat Trump and restore, be the calming influence we need at a particular time in our nation. On Trump's side, it was never about the issues. He goes down to Miami, he's gonna scare you and show you pictures of Castro, and he's gonna say, this is that guy is, he's just like that, you can't vote for him. He's gonna go to, I spend a lot of time, I'm a part-time resident in North Carolina, in Concord, North Carolina. I'm watching the TV ads there, and I know Vice President Biden, and after watching a weekend of watching TV down there, I was looking over my shoulder because I thought Biden was looking to kill any black man and put you in jail um, if you were black, because that's what the TV ads were telling me down there. That's what Trump was doing. He finds it's not about broad, useful, informative issues that Trump was pushing. It was finding pockets of division that would get votes. And that's all that it was, unfortunately. So I see this, you know, I don't know that we can look at this campaign cycle and say, you know, this is where issues died. <laughs> I think they died, I guess, just for the moment, but I hope that another campaign, when it comes along in another four years, that, that real issues can be addressed rather than these, these pocket scare tactics that were used across the country. Let me ask another question that I know is going to uh, receive a, a lot of analysis in the weeks to come, and that is to say that it appears that once again the polling was far enough off as to have misled a number of people into believing uh, that there was going to be an easy outcome in one direction or another. We're a very data-driven school. Uh, we market the fact that we believe in hard data. What went wrong with those polls and what do we need to do as educators uh, and as researchers to improve the quality of the data that we work with? Particularly around public policy. Anyone? I think, you know, I think Richard, uh, Richard was right when he said that he thought that there was actual um, 
dishonesty going on with poll responses. Um, Richard, mm. you want to talk a little bit more about that? I thought that was really intriguing. Um, yeah, it was. It, it, it's sort of the um, uh, Mayor Bradley, or Bradley when he ran in LA, and the effect of people saying to the pollsters, you know, what they think that the the, the um, majority wants to hear, but in actuality, they go into the booth and vote differently than what they were telling the pollsters. And you know, the the approach that. Trump has made with his followers is you do what you say, whatever you need to do to try and achieve your goal and objective, whether it's true, whether it's, whether it's going to hurt anybody, it, it was just rampant. And you could tell when you saw them stick the microphone in the face of some of those Trump supporters, they would just regurgitate the stuff that he was saying or that the, 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 the members of his campaign were saying. And whether, whether they believed it or whether they even understood it, it was irrelevant. And the connection to social media that reinforces a lot of these things, if people aren't um, able to distinguish the difference, right? And, and, and analyze it with a critical mind, then a lot of folks see what comes across their screen as being truthful and it's, and, and Folks have gotten real sophisticated at making it look authentic, making it sound authentic, and it's quite, quite frankly not authentic, right? And, and and that's what Russia exploited to the fullest. So I'm I'm gonna oh is that Rebecca? Yeah, you know one of the things that struck me uh, in 2016 and in 2020 was what you can tell from the exit polls and the things that people are saying are their primary concern. In 2016, one of the very early exit polls showed that change was a high priority for a huge number of people. And I remember thinking, oh no, right? And that to me, it wasn't, are you voting for Hillary or, or Trump? It was that issue. Similarly, the exit polls for this election, I thought were almost absolutely reversed from each other in terms of Trump supporters um, looking at the economy, safety and crime. Um, whereas if you looked at uh, Biden voters, it was um, racial injustice, it was coronavirus, it was climate change. And they were almost completely, I mean, not exactly, but there was a, they were flipped. And I think that we underestimate how viscerally people are attached to certain priorities and how they are voting on those issues sometimes in ways that the polls disguise. Because had you been asking people which rank these things in terms of what you prioritize, we could probably have all said, oh, that's a Biden person, that's a Trump person. So I would like to see us just understand that phenomenon of the accuracy of the exit polls in terms of priorities better and start using that before as more as predictors as opposed to after the fact um, indicators of how people voted. Rebecca, do you think that there's, I mean, there's, is there a difference between exit polling and pre-election polling? Because I think there is. I think, I think people coming out of the polls actually might be more honest on where they actually voted then uh, in advance. I think that's true. And I also think though that it is often targeted towards, well, what do you care about? What are your priorities? Maybe in a different way than, um, are you gonna vote for this person or that person, right? So I, I think we need a better mix of issue oriented um, polling incorporated with the person oriented polling uh, beforehand. But I think you're right. I think there's more truth that comes out in the exit because you've already voted, so you can say what you did. So as we wind down, I'm, I'm going to ask each of you to make a brief comment um, on what you think our next steps ought to be at this point. Again, we don't know the outcome of this particular election, but there are a number of questions that have been raised uh, by participants in this conversation. Uh, some have gone to what you think should happen next around issues like racial profiling in a context where, for example, police unions have endorsed uh, President Trump. How do you deal with that? Uh, we have uh, questions that have come up around 
um, uh, Governor Dukakis' uh, statement that we need to have working groups. And it's less a question than a recommendation that uh, working groups really have to work uh, as opposed to simply sitting around to talk. Uh, we have questions about the Electoral College. We have questions about um, what the likelihood is of uh, uh, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico becoming uh, states at this point as a way of offsetting some of the Electoral College uh, deficiencies that we've seen. So I'm gonna ask each of you to make a final comment looking forward at this moment. Uh, and, and I know that uh, some of the answers are going to be shaped by whatever the final uh, structure of, of things uh, will be. But we also know that we're going to have a divided Congress again, uh, that policymaking uh, will be bifurcated in a number of ways. We have a different Supreme Court. Um, what is it that you would advise whoever wins to think about next? And what's your advice uh, for the university as we move forward uh, in, into this next era? Uh, who wants to start? Tom. Thank you, Ted. Great questions. Um, if I had all the answers, I don't know where I'd be, but probably not right here right now. But um, I, you know, I think first I'll take just the very briefly, I mean, universities have a very special role to play uh, in societies, uh, they are great equalizers. They 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 bring different viewpoints together along a set of norms uh, of, of of democratic participation, of of, of engagement, uh, of of equality, of egalitarianism. And so, you know, I think that that since universities as or as institutions adhere to those fundamental values we are particularly positioned to continue to foster that dialogue. And, and nationally, I, I think that could be an example because um, really where I wanna see us go next is to, is to re restore, return, whatever it is to our democratic, I say small d democratic norms and values um, uh, of, of equality, of liberty, of, of respect, of dignity. Um, and, and also respect for the policy process and the political process around that. Um, and because we've seen a fundamental departure from that, and it's not, it's not just the president. Um, I'm, I'm talking larger organizations in the US as well. Um, I don't know how to do that. I have some thoughts, but, but I, I would like to see the country come together and, and by adhering to the, these very basic fundamental values, if we don't have that, we cannot come together um, in respect in, in working groups to Mike's comments about about that we need to respect each other's viewpoints we need to then adhere to these democratic values that make this country a, a special place um, and I, I'll stop there but I, I think universities are well positioned based on based on the buy-in of our community in support of those values um, that's one part of the puzzle I think thank you all for a great discussion I appreciate it yeah Jeremy so this is a tough question. Here's what I would suggest. Going back to what I said before, the country lacks vocabulary in which to tackle crucial issues. Uh, a good example of something that we could do to, to fix that uh, might be something like what Andrew Yang suggested during the primary season uh, of developing a scorecard for how is the society doing uh, that's different from just GDP and the stock market, uh, public health measures, uh, happiness index, uh, time with your family, uh, so that we could then hold our leaders accountable for how we were improving on the, that sort of index. That's just an example of the broader challenge of trying to describe to people why politics matters and why it makes a difference for them to get involved and pay attention. We need artists. We need filmmakers, we need novelists. Uh, we don't just need lawyers, although every now and then a good lawyer can, can help uh, uh, because uh, it has to be in a vocabulary that's, um, you know, they're all, our society is filled, it also has to be diverse. I mean, if it's just a bunch of white guys, it's clearly not gonna work, right? So, so it's, gotta, it's gotta be, uh, a, a, you know, a, group. And a university could be, we could be a catalyst. We could start a center for that. 
Uh, we have a program at the university already uh, in media advocacy, uh, which is aimed uh, at training people to communicate with the public and we could expand that. So that's what I would suggest. Voices from North Carolina, maybe? I, one of the things that I, strikes me as an educator is the concept of literacy, social media literacy, um, the ability of uh, the next generations coming up to be able to, Hillary, the kind of things that you're doing and teaching the whole civic process. Um, nobody understands the constitution. Nobody understands so many of these things. And so literacy for all generations, uh, whether there are first graders or there are our freshmen or there are graduate students or there are adults. Um, life is worth more than, what is it, 144 characters? Is that what a tweet is? I'm not sure, I never tweet, so I don't know, but life is more than that. And, um, and our experiences are more than that. And we've shortened it all down to that. And, we, and so I say literacy what, at every level is what I would, you know, at the university level and on down. I, I can't say it any better than, than Peg. I'll just say I'm, I'm uh, hopeful of the future simply because, um, you know, when I you know, think about my own children who are young adults you know, participating in the, the process and um, being active uh, and also being in education, I just really believe that, um, you know, our, our elections are, are in large part a, um, a statement about the kind of future that we want. And, you know, that was what it was for me. I mean, I remember thinking literally about this time last year, I'm probably gonna vote for whoever my children tell me to vote for because it's their future, not mine, that we are really looking at. Um, turned out we all agreed, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's a, I, I'm, I'm hopeful because I see a lot of energy, not only in my own family, but, but in my community. And, um, in the school that I work for, so. Dan Jackson. I'm gonna go hyper-local and say, let's convene a Dukakis working group to dismantle racial profiling by the NUPD. Um, and I would also say, let's elect Jeremy Paul as president. <laughs> okay, West Coast, Dan, David, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I want to build on Tom's comment about that. I think we have to we have to create more civic engagement. I mean, that's how we'll we'll get literacy. Maybe um, it's not just about educating our students, but but you know, Northeastern's now in eight, nine, ten cities in North America, and so how do we be, how do we become better members of our community to help build that literacy? Uh, the external affairs group runs a, a civic experience events that they do, but you know, we do like four or five of them a year and. Honestly, I'd like to be doing one a month on my campus on different different topics, and, but I, I think it's just getting more conversation going. And to my earlier comments, maybe getting, making sure we get a, a well balanced um, collection of people. And if we can get local leaders to assign us to a working group, all the better. Jenny, so I would say we need to listen to and respect our the youth. I think uh, following up what Carly mentioned, and I think we need to diversify power and center racial justice, social justice, and economic justice at the core. Um, and I think we can do that by promoting anti-racist and feminist leadership, which is leadership that acknowledges the structural um, uh, systems that have that lead to have led to and are perpetuating inequities and disparities. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that when women, people of color, indigenous folks come into leadership spaces where they've been historically excluded, uh, we are better able to center the social justice component. So I think that's really important for, for everyone to be considering. Uh, Dan? Oh, he shakes his I think head. I go, I, um, you know, I go along with it. I think Peg has said it, uh, on media literacy. I think that's important. You know, from the youngest of ages, if someone, once someone picks up a device and gets on social media for the first time, it's almost as if there needs to be a, a course or something that, that gives some kind of understanding and guidance as to this, 
great scary world of social media you're about ready to enter into. I mean, you know, it is scarier than than not getting a driver's license and driving a car, right? I, I think you need to get some, you should have some kind of a license before you uh, drive on so, the social media highway. And, and then journalism students, I think it's important for me and other professors um, to, to continue to encourage them as they go out into the workplace to get outside the bubble. Don't rely on, don't rely on polls to guide you to a story. Find the people who um, have real concerns and then write about those concerns, broadcast those concerns. If the media had done a job of that, perhaps um, they would have seen the anger and the, the hurt out there across the country that ended up getting Donald Trump into office in the first place. Yeah, Hillary? Well, I'm I'm uh, wishing that the responses um, the response button wasn't disabled because I just want to like show my appreciation for for all the other panelists in the comments here. Um, I think you know, kind of big picture. I think I'm preaching to the choir when I say that we need to abolish electoral college. You know, big picture. Um, it's it's antiquated. It's uh, has racist roots. It continues to to perpetuate um, inequity. Um, so so that's big picture. I think to <coughs> around media literacy, um, we need to restore civics education in K through 12. Yes. Um, we need it. Um, there are some incredible organizations here in Boston that are trying to do it. Um, Generation Citizen, We the People, um, so, some great organizations, but this cannot be um, led by outside of the schools. It has to be in the public schools. It has to start young. Um, I think the schools are, you know, pressured to teach to, to tests. And, you know, we know uh, this is a whole nother conversation to think about reform in K through 12 schools. But I think um, in ensuring that in Massachusetts just passed legislation last year for an action based civics curriculum, we need that across the country um, and we need it right away. Mm -hmm. Richard? I was hoping you wouldn't make me last. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I love the small group idea. Governor Dukakis signed me up. I'd be more than happy to, to be a part of that. Um, I, I encourage us to look around at the students we come in contact with and try to um, engage them in a way where you know you could have some really substantive dialogue with them. I tell my students all the time, you know, Donald Trump sat in somebody's classroom, President Obama sat in somebody's classroom. And for some of these students, you know, we are the last voice they hear before they graduate that can really help to shape who they are and what they do when they go out into the world. And I think if, if, if you can mentor somebody, mentor them, you know, I, I think it was Dan that said, politics is local. You know, all the work that we should do should be right in the area that we have the most direct impact. You know, you'd be surprised how much students take in and listen to you. You know, I can't tell you how many students have come into my class and talked about Governor Dukakis's class and <laughs> some of something, some nugget of information that Governor Dukakis shared with them. They remember those things, and I think we can impact our future if we if we really try hard to impact those young people that are around us. Rebecca, at the action I was at today, I explained what safety marshals do, and I think it's a lesson that we can all bring home. And I said that we volunteer to uplift and center the voices of Black brown, indigenous, immigrant, and youth leaders, and people with disabilities, because those are the voices that aren't heard. And the fact that some of us need to volunteer to get injured, possibly, or to put ourselves between them and those who would do them harm in order to create spaces where their voices can be safely heard is a problem. And that's a problem with democracy because it means that we are not integrating all of the voices that we, we say we value. And I think that the academy has to look at that too. Are we actually centering those voices in our classrooms? Are we having those conversations amongst ourselves? Uh, and I think too often the answer to that is no. I'd also like to suggest that as we think about the complexity of these problems that we're facing, 
we should be looking at the pedagogy of complexity. Everything about the way humans interact with each other predisposes us to create these wicked problems, but there's very little about the way our brains work and the way our emotions work and the way we're educated and socialized and facing the media that allows us to deal with complex and dynamic problems. And that is, yes, that includes the literacy folks have talked about that talk that involves having better conversations, but we need to be teaching people how to think differently in terms of systems and complexity. And we can all be doing that. And that's what I would suggest we do. Governor Dukakis. I've already said too much, uh, Ted, but uh, it took me about 20 years of active political life to turn myself into a reasonably decent consensus builder. I was a great talker when I started in politics. I wasn't a very good listener. And I got my head handed to me in a gubernatorial election and asked myself what had happened and decided maybe it was time for me to spend less time talking and more time listening. Um, and that was an important, that was an important lesson. So helping our students, helping the folks that we know and love to become good listeners is an important part of what we should be doing. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for uh, uh, what is certainly an engaged conversation. Um, everyone needs to remain patient. Uh, we may have some uh, results tomorrow or the next day, and then there'll be litigation, uh, certainly, uh, that will uh, tie up the final result for uh, weeks after that. Um, in the meantime, I'm reminded, uh, and Rebecca has pointed this out, uh, our public servants have continued to function. They're delivering the mail. Uh, they are uh, uh, attending to uh, parking. Uh, they're managing our services. They're keeping our uh, subway and bus systems running um, throughout all of these big policy discussions. Uh, many of the people who've been reviled because they work in the public sector are continuing to show their commitment to public service and they're continuing to do their jobs well and effectively uh, on the front lines. And let's remember uh, that however this uh, election works out, um, there are folks out there who are working with and serving us. Um, and that many of our graduates, in fact, um, have become those people. Um, and we need to continue to uh, support our public servants throughout all of the changes uh, that are taking place at the same time that we think about uh, COVID and other kinds of large public policy issues. Uh, next uh, week is uh, a, uh, a holiday week on, on Wednesday. So we will be back in two weeks um, with uh, some discussions about uh, design and other ways of thinking uh, about public policy. So uh, my best wishes to all. Um, we all hope for uh, the best possible outcome uh, of all of these counts. And I thank all of you for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you. you, Ted. Thanks.